All right, well, let's turn in our Bibles again tonight to Daniel chapter 11. It is Daniel 11, not Hebrews 11. Try to, try to be clear on that. It's Hebrews 11, not Dan- Daniel 11. <laughs> just, wanted, just wanted to catch you. Just want to make sure you're, you're right in the frame of mind you should be in. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is not a pleasant chapter. And uh, what is going to happen is not pleasant. It's very, very bad what's going to happen in the world. We cannot imagine how bad the coming Antichrist is going to be. We cannot imagine how many people are going to follow him. Christ said in John 5, verse 46, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another will come in his own name, him you will receive. And um, uh, on my uh, five days at Southfields this week, I would say that, listen, uh, to just refuse, probably one out of a hundred would take the gospel tract. One out of a hundred. Now, it's always worse at Southfields than any time during the year. I don't, I'm going back tomorrow. I feel God wants me to be there, but I'm, I wish I could go to Brixton or go to, uh, uh, any place but Southfields. But again, uh, the world is going to receive Antichrist. So please, if you say, why does the Bible emphasize it so much in Daniel, this primary book of Old Testament prophecy, it's because the need is so great. People are going to receive this man. They are going to reject Christ and receive Antichrist, and all over the world, and and uh, it, it goes. It's satanic. It's a it's a thing that uh, defies uh, description or reason. And so we've got here in Daniel eleven, we've got a long road leading up to uh, a type of the Antichrist. And so the Bible is saying, look at this man. And you got a picture of him right here. He doesn't look so great here. And this is probably really what he did look like. Look at him. The world is going to follow this man. Uh, or uh, not this man, but uh, here is a man who uh, will be a type of the Antichrist. And so we've got a long row of kings uh, coming out of Alexander the Great's empire. Alexander died, empire divided into four sections, but north and south became powerful, and out of the north you had a series of Antiochuses, and each one got progressively worse. We've had Antiochus the first, hardly any mention of, Antiochus Theos, Antiochus the Great, and then we're going to get Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, uh, Epiphanes means a manifestation of God. And so this is this one. And then it will go directly from the type to the antitype, from the actual picture of Antichrist, how bad he is. Look at him. This is how bad he's going to be until the final Antichrist. And in one verse, from verse 35 to verse 36, it skips the centuries, and it takes us right down to the Antichrist of the last days. And so uh, the warning is needful. People will accept Antichrist rather than Christ. So we've got these forerunners culminating in this man, then it skips the centuries, and the last uh, ten verses of the chapter deal with the Antichrist himself. The Antichrist is coming. People will receive him. You know, you have strange things, and I will tell you these things. You know, I don't know. 
uh, what's true, what, you know, but be aware, be aware of the fact. I've always thought that uh, as far as recent public figures, I, I would say Barack Obama takes some beating. I would also say Bill Clinton took some beating. I, I would say that when Bill Clinton got up and spoke, he had a persona about him that was really quite unique. In spite of everything about him, the people really fell for him. And um, yet it is a fact, and this is, seems to be documented. And, it, and I knew there was things wrong with the Clintons. But they're getting out now uh, a list of names, 47 people that uh, were associated with the Clintons, and then they died, and they were often in conflict with the Clintons, and then they died a rather strange death, and a whole list of them. And this is making the rounds, and you can look at it, and if it's not true, it's not true, but it appears to be very well documented. It gives the person's name, what their relationship was with the Clintons, and how they died. And really, when you come, if you had a few, that's not very good, but if you got 47, then that really takes some looking at. So what's going on here? So, uh, again, uh, you have forerunners, and never did a person have such a persona as Bill Clinton. When he got up and spoke, they listened. Or Barack Obama, the same. So we don't know. But, anyway, we've got this uh, personification of the Antichrist, uh, but then we skip to the actual Antichrist himself. Uh, in this chapter... Uh, in this long list of king of the south, king of the north, we've got 135 prophecies and fulfilled literally, just as the Bible said they would be. Um, and so we, we will, I wonder if somebody could read for us though, chapter 11, verses 10 to 20, just to read it. Uh, it's hard to take it all in, but it's the Word of God, and in honor to the Scriptures, we will read it. And so from 10 to 20, uh, if you'd like to read that. But his son shall be stirred up, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come, and overflow, and pass through. Then shall he return, and to be stirred up, even to his fortress." And the king of the south shall be moved with choler, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come, and cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed." He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease, Without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, 
but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. All right, thank you very much. And that was virtually all of that was dealing with one king of the north. This is Antiochus the Great. He's trying to fight against Egypt. Uh, in the end, he's been repulsed, but he tries to give his own daughter to the, Egypt, to the Egyptians and hope that that political uh, marriage will result in him getting control in the south. It fails, and he ends up going to war against Roman ships. So all sorts of things. But Daniel saw it 200 years in advance, and you can trace it from history. And it's one of those uh, remarkable things that we've got an awful lot of history for this period of time. And so the, the Bible validates the history, but history also coincides with the Bible. And it's a, a remarkable thing. And it's one of the reasons why modern rationalistic teachers today like to say, oh, Daniel was written after these events. Because you've got 135 prophecies. They were all fulfilled to the letter. And you can go through. It can be complicated. Uh, we've given you the basic notes on it. You can look at this. But all of this now is a road to the Antichrist. But let's bow for prayer and ask God to speak to us this evening. Father, again tonight we... Uh, thank Thee that we're looking for the blessed hope. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Christ, uh, the, the, uh, uh, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. But, Lord, Thou hast warned us that this man is coming. And even as we look at Europe now, and Europe must unite or, or really disintegrate and and political union. And so, Father, we think we've taken another major step. And even so, come, Lord Jesus. It must be near. And just help us as we pray and get the gospel out and read our Bibles for such a time as this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you've got a number of Antiochuses. You'll get mixed up. It, you can mark your Bible. You, you do have to have help on this chapter to keep up with who's fighting who. Uh, and um, Antiochus III is defeated by Ptolemy III. Antiochus III is Antiochus the Great. And uh, uh, as it turns out, virtually ten of these verses refer to him. But he's never quite successful in defeating the king of the south. And uh, he, uh, but he comes, he's defeated in verse 11. Uh, he goes against them, he is defeated. He takes his army uh, through Israel. Every time he goes, he goes through Israel. Israel suffers. Israel's the mill in the middle of the millstone between the two warring factions goes, he gets as far as Gaza, and he regroups, but that delay in Gaza allows the king of the south to get an army against him and defeat him, and uh, defeats him quite uh, substantially. If he realized how much the extent of of how the king of the north was weakened, he could have taken his army, the Egyptian army could have gone all the way to Damascus and taken it and probably defeated the king of the north, or the kings of the north for quite a few, quite a few generations. But he didn't. Uh, he uh, defeated him. Now, the point, and you've got this in your notes, while this is happening, uh, all sorts of intrigue. You have kings that are a little bit uh, sympathetic toward Israel. You've got kings that are not. Generally, generally, during this period, it is the Egyptians that have control over Israel, uh, more so than the Assyrians, more so. And at this time, uh, there was a number of kings that were favorable, showed kindness to Israel, 
And Israel perhaps unwisely responded to that kindness and went down into Alexandria, became merchants there, and really ended up leading much of the business affairs of of Egypt. Well, that lasted all right for this one or two kings, but then another king came to power, and he was violently anti-Semitic. He gathered the Jews, uh, and this is a, this is in history. Gathered the Jews of Alexandria, gathered them into a great field, and at this time, and you can read about this, the, uh, the Egyptians were using elephants in their warfare. And he just turned wild, wild elephants against the, uh, against the poor uh, Jews. And so a lot of things are happening. Israel must stay uh, close to Jerusalem, uh, never trust a foreign power, uh, must trust the Lord. They didn't quite learn that. They trusted. God warned them again and again in the prophets. Uh, Egypt is a broken reed, and if you r- lean on it, it will break and cut your arm. Don't do that. Well, they leaned on Egypt during this time, and that that happened. But the king of the north, the Syrian force, severely uh, uh, weakened. Go, they go back, they regroup. I've got a mistake in your notes there. It says after 14 years, Antiochus defeats Ptolemy the fifth. That should be after 14 years, Antiochus attacks Egypt. Just say that, and that's correct. It's it's not a correct state. He he did not defeat Ptolemy. But now the king of the the north is going to come, and he's going to try it again. And he comes and. Again, he goes through Israel, uh, and Israel, of course, is under Egyptian control, and it would be necessary to defeat the forces there, the Egyptian forces in Israel. And he, he moves against Egypt, uh, and, uh, but he gets so far, and he hears a very distressing word. Another power, at this time is rising. Rome is beginning to rise, and Rome has entered a treaty with Egypt. And so he thinks twice about attacking Egypt. He starts to attack, but then he draws back, but he has another plan. He's got a a lovely young daughter, and her name is Cleopatra. And so here's the famous Cleopatra that everyone knows about. Name is Cleopatra. She's very young. And at this time, the king of the south, very young too. So you've got older uh, people running the country. And she's only seven and he's only seven. Not a little bit too young to get married. But they... Propose it as a, a, and she goes to live down there, and actually they get married when they're in their early teens. But the idea is that Cleopatra will uh, just uh, turn Egypt to the king of the north, and uh, she does not do that. She tells her young husband what her father wants her to do and reveals it. They reveal it to the Romans. The Romans then start attacking uh, Syrian ships. But this Cleopatra becomes a very uh, strange, intriguing uh, lady and all sorts of intrigue and... um, she does an awful lot, and that's the, the, the story and many stories about her, and you can read about her. But um, she betrays her father. She sides with the Egyptians. She sides with the Romans. She congratulates the Romans for defeating her father. 
Her father is then in turn uh, going to uh, his generals say, you need to fight the Romans. He does. He launches 300 ships against the Romans, loses them all, and uh, so he's defeated really by his own daughter. And that's the, the essence of it. And defeated by the Roman navy on page 310, you, you've got reference to this, how the king of the north, uh, it says after this he shall turn his face unto the isles and shall take a, 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 a many, but a prince of his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then shall he turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. He, he was defeated, uh, ships destroyed, goes back to his own country, uh, worshiping in the, his own idolatrous temple. He's assassinated. But uh, before he died, Rome having defeated him, uh, makes the king of the north give up half of Turkey and all of his other places that he had in Europe. And uh, it's after that that he's assassinated. And then they laid him with a very heavy annual taxation. And that brings up the next uh, king of the north. And verse uh, 20 On page 311, it says, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes. So the last thing that Antiochus the Great did was just raise taxes. He tried to plunder the uh, Jews, the churches, the church in Jerusalem, the uh, temple in Jerusalem. Uh, He, but he died raising taxes. Another man and his son in his stead is a tax raiser, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. So he dies, he's... and then uh, there's intrigue, and there's a warfare uh, amongst the rival claimants, but one fellow comes to the fore, and he seems so nice. And he comes in by flatteries. And he had a, obviously a pre- pleasant appearance. He must have been a good orator. But his true colors certainly uh, began to show. We, let's read about him. Again, there's a lot here we won't fully understand. But please remember, the Bible warns about the coming Antichrist. Uh, Sometimes it mentions him directly, but in the book of Daniel, the Holy Spirit will tell us about the coming Antichrist by pointing to Antiochus Epiphanes, a forerunner to the Antichrist. And then after you, you read about him, he's a vile person. In verse 21, you read about him all the way really to verse 35 or nearly so. And then immediately we go to the willful king, and we're clearly in the last days. Would somebody like to stand and read verses 21 uh, to 35? And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably, and obtain the kingdom by flatteries." And with the arms of a flood they shall be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up, and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. 
but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land." At the time appointed he shall return, and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return, and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return, and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many." Yet they shall fall by the sword, and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil, many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hopen with a little help, that many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed." All right, so, and then the next uh, verses, it goes into the willful king, and this takes you on into chapter 12, and that is clearly the tribulation period. So uh, Daniel was made to understand that, yes, Israel is going to be in between these warring factions. Israel uh, will have dreadful days ahead, but none were more dreadful than the 11 years that, Alec, that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, certainly the latter part of those 11 years. And a man came to the throne. He is the young brother of Cleopatra. And he uh, seems to have, a, uh, as far as deceit and treachery and cunning, uh, he went far beyond what she did. Uh, but she no doubt uh, showed him some tricks, and he learned his lessons well. And we've given you just a, a little summary of this man. We will look at him a bit in detail, but uh, uh, just to, to show you uh, on, on page 312, notice the dates there. He's the eighth ruler in the north. His surname, Epiphanes, means the visible God. A humble fella. Uh, when you looked at him, he was the visible God. He was Jupiter or Zeus or whoever he might want you to think he was. Uh, but Epiphanes is not too far from Epimenes, which means the madman. And many people soon realize no uh, he's a madman, and he really was. Uh, and uh, uh, but he he is uh, uh, so famous. Uh, he wanted to Hellenize again these leaders. And you know the uh, Bible says in in, in uh, Romans twelve one and two, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. To acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable in, in the will of God. And so uh, uh, that's what every believer has to face. And, and we saw again on Thursday night, Pharaoh said, okay, we'll let you go. But stay in Egypt. Don't leave Egypt. 
sacrifice in Egypt. When Moses said, no, we're not going to do that, he said, okay, well, if you must leave, don't go very far away. In other words, be close enough for me to get you back. Uh, and so that's the way it is with Christians. We come to Christ and Satan begins to say, well, if you must be a Christian, uh, stay in Egypt. Just be like the rest of the world. Uh, you believe in Jesus, just believe in Jesus. Don't come out from among them, be separate. But if you must go away a bit, don't go too far away. Now, this is exactly the, the way when the... Uh, the uh, the Egyptians in this double millstone that Israel was between, the Egyptians were a bit kinder to the Jews. They let them get on with their uh, their temple services or sacrifices. Not the Greek, not the not the Syrians, not the kings of the north. They wanted to Hellenize them. They wanted them to spend all their time at the gymnasium, you know, the, the Greek, uh, th that type of thing. They wanted them to uh, be like the gods. They wanted them to, to take in Greek uh, philosophy. Uh, everything that was Greek, the Greek language, uh, the Greek uh, way of, of life, uh, Greek knowledge, uh, become all of that. And uh, what uh, Antiochus did, Antiochus realized that as long as we've got these Jewish priests uh, telling the people to stay close to the Holy Covenant, uh, then, uh, you know, we're not going to do that. So the, the, the priest at the time was Onias III, Antiochus, comes in and replaces him. Now, in all that has happened up until now, since Alexander the Great died, no one has interfered with the Jewish priesthood. Antiochus does that. And he replaces him with a, a, a young priest, uh, a Jewish priest, that's been thoroughly Hellenized. Uh, he's imbibed all of the Greek culture. And he'll get the, the, the Jews to become Greeks. But even that wasn't moving fast enough. And people said to Antiochus, they're still moving too slow. Then he brought in a third priest by the name of Menelaus. And he was totally Greek. And he wasn't even in the priestly line. And so they put him on the throne. And so uh, here is a, uh, you talk about being conformed to the world, which uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about. Here is an example of, of uh, again, being conformed to Greek culture, Greek uh, clothes, Greek styles, Greek language, Greek religion, Greek morals, everything Greek. And uh, it was working. It was working. And he pressured and pressured. Now, his army moved south again. Uh, Antiochus' army were going to try to attack Egypt again. The Ro uh, Romans stop him. Tell him and he not to. And he becomes so angry that in 168 B.C. he goes back, he attacks Jerusalem. And upwards of 80,000 were slaughtered. Uh, he uh, put down laws, no more Sabbath, no holy days. Uh, they put a statue of Zeus or Jupiter, the uh, accounts differ, uh, in the temple, they may have broken down the temple altar itself and put this statue of Zeus in its place. Before that, they took a pig, they sacrificed it on the altar of Israel. They took the broth of the pig, spread it all over the temple precinct, 
And the Bible calls this an abomination of desolation. But it's only a picture. It's only a picture. This is not the real one. But this is what the Bible does to warn us. It gives us this entire section. First, we've got the type, the picture of Antiochus. And then we've got, I mean, the picture of the Antichrist, and we've got the Antichrist himself. And so, 168, and again, we'll give you the details of it next week. God, uh, you might have seen some uh, uh, indications of it in the reading uh, in verse 32. But such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Again, let's Hellenize everyone. Uh, but the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And uh, we're going to tell you about this group called the Maccabees. Maccabees means hammer. And Judas Maccabeus. And it, there were six battles that they fought against impossible odds. And they won and they reclaim Jerusalem and uh, uh, cleanse the temple. Now, the Bible says Antiochus will be defeated without hand. They didn't kill Antiochus, but uh, the Lord did. The Lord did and just took him out of the way. And uh, the Jews, and does anybody know what the Jews did after they, uh, after they uh, cleansed the temple? They had Hanukkah. Hanukkah. They had a Hanukkah service. And we're going to show you what that Hanukkah service is. And uh, the lighting of the candles. And they did it over eight days. And the story is they didn't have enough oil. But God supernaturally. It's, uh, it's, the menorah's got seven candles. But this has got eight. And uh, there were eight days, I'm sorry, it's got nine, there's eight days that they lit each candle. There's a larger a candle in the middle, and that was the candle used to light. But again, it happened on Christmas. And that's an amazing thing. It's right at Christmas. So you got Saturnella happening at Christmas. You got another terrible Roman feast happening at Christmas, but you've got Hanukkah happening at Christmas, the day spring from on high. And uh, so, but take your choice. And that's the way people today take still the Roman feast, Christmas time, and make it the biggest drunk of the year, frankly. And, uh, but, uh, that was Hanukkah. And it's really a, and Christ honored it in chapter 10 of, of John. It's called the Feast of Dedication. It's called the Feast of Lights. Hanukkah means dedication. And we'll show you some of this in the, in the, uh, in the next message or so. But, uh, again, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, Egypt, I'm sorry, Israel was constantly trying to rely on either the Syrians to the north or the Egyptians to the south. But the people who knew their God and this smaller band of people, they, uh, they stayed true and they just believed the Bible and they did what God uh, wanted them to do. So uh, we'll look at this further. But it's a wonderful, that verse, the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And there was this uh, remnant. Uh, and uh, tragically, though, you know, every good thing comes under attack. And for many that followed the Maccabees, uh, by and large, they were good, they were sound. But then they started going off the line a bit. And really, when you say, where did the Pharisees come from? Well, they probably did t take their roots to the Maccabees. But it was because they left the Holy Covenant 
and the Word and the Scriptures and started adding a lot of other things. So any time you start out for God, God gives revival and people come back to the Lord, Satan will immediately go to work to try to corrupt it. And he, he began to work on the Maccabees. But here's a picture, uh, and, and uh, he, here we've got uh, a, a type, a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Doesn't look like a very uh, particularly nice fellow there, but that's probably close to how he looked. And uh, I, you can read about the history of this particular bust of him. Uh, it's in a museum in Berlin, and uh, it's quite interesting how they how they found it. So it's likely the way he looks. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, again tonight, we're thankful for uh, an account of the people that knew their God, and that little band that uh, cleansed the temple and defeated the host of of Antichrist, as it were, and stood for Thee. And and uh, though many tried to corrupt them with flatteries, yet they just stayed true to Thee and true to Thy Word. And so, Father, for these days, that we would stand true for Thee with all of the currents and cross-currents and just to stay close to our Bible, close to prayer, uh, close to the Great Commission, just serving Thee in simplicity and truth. Help us, we pray. Bless now as we close our service in Jesus' name. Amen.